Welcome to the New York Times podcast, your Rhythm 95 versus Record Hospital. With music, news, and criticism, I'm your host, John Caramonica. Last night we let the liquor talk. I can't remember everything we said, but we said it all. You told me that you wish I was somebody you never met. But baby, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> this is deeply overdue. Let's just get out of the way right off the rip. K Santa is here. I'm here. I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm coming back home. What's up, sweetie? How you doing? <laughs> I, I like the fact that because back in the 90s, wow, at Harvard University, double wow, we were colleagues at the radio station, triple wow, you running the hip hop department, me running the punk rock department, quadruple and quintuple wow. And then both of us went to the New York Times at different places. Absolutely. And now here we are. Talking about country music. As God intended. <laughs> exactly right. If you do not know Kay, Kay is a staff writer with The New Yorker. Prior to that, Kay had the pop music critic job at The New York Times, the seat in which I now sit, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> it's Neil Strauss's seat, That's I true. Really, we all are continuing to warm Neil Strauss's seat. Shout out Neil Strauss. Kay is also the author of Major Labels, A History of Pop and Music in Several Genres. First of all, lovely shelves behind you today. We're going video on today because we're going to have a lively conversation and we want to get the full effect. Kay wanted to do this in person. I was a baby because it looked like it might rain. So that, that right off the rip, the imbalance is there. We're really, it's tough. He hit me with that gremlin excuse. I really did. I, I was going to shrivel up. Kay, your, your shelves are great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, my book is on your the shelf. Your book is literally facing forward. Books. It's literally facing forward. Regrettably, the video for this will not be published, however. I, I'm sorry to say. But, you know, that was there. That way, no one could... Actually, this is just how I have it set up that for whenever I do Zoom. Vibe. You just like to look at it every time you come in. I have the book, Major Labels, in stores now. In stores now. Underneath, uh, above the book, I have two figurines of the critics from the Muppets. Statler and Waldorf. Statler and Waldorf. Those are the uh, the guiding spirits here which one, in my home office. Which one is you? It really depends on the day, John. I'm going to I'm gonna check in at the end of this podcast we're gonna and, find, and maybe we're gonna get a find, sense we're gonna find out. whether I was... If I was more statlery, or we're, we're going to we're going to do -si do throughout this episode mm -hmm. trading off. This is a, <laughs> a, a jovial way to start a potentially challenging conversation about one of the most popular musicians in the country. And that would be Morgan Wallen. OK, I have occasionally felt like you and I are the only people writing about Morgan Wallen. Uh, sometimes sometimes it feels that way, which is odd considering how popular this man is. The third Morgan Wallen album just came out. It's called One Thing at a Time predictably debuted at the top of the charts. Dangerous, the double album, which is the previous album, stayed in the Billboard Top 10 for a year, two years, who even knows at this point, all in the face of a lot of chicanery on Wallen's part. Okay, you want to get the messy stuff out of the way or you want to come back to it? Well, the Morgan Wallen arc, he has this kind of false start where he's coming off of The Voice and he, he has an album, it does okay, but then he really starts to catch fire online. And as this thing is building and people are getting more excited, excited about him, he has the small stumble at first, right? Which is where he gets booked for SNL and then gets caught violating mask protocol. I think he was like at a party in a bar. He was definitely in violation of the, of the, of the <laughs> protocol. Yes, yes. Some, some, some unfauci like behavior was happening. That and is so he got, he got canceled from SNL. He was eventually rebooked. And in fact, they did a sketch kind of making fun of that thing. And then he had the more serious controversy. When was it? Was it, it's now two years ago? This is a little more than two years ago. This is in yeah. late, mid to late January of 2021. Yeah, where someone catches him stumbling out of what seems to be a friend's car late at night. And he uses the N word seemingly to refer to his friend, like maybe in a playful way. I don't think we've ever gotten an identification on who Who's the, the friend, friend was. No, we definitely is have the, not. Is the friend black? I don't no think idea. we know. We don't know. We know that Morgan Wallen is white. But but this is, I think this is important context, right? Because it would be a very different story if a black person had come forward saying this guy, Morgan Wallen, insulted me using this word. Instead, this was something that he was saying with friends, maybe trying to be funny, maybe trying to be hip hop. He seemed to be saying it in the way that someone who maybe listened to hip hop and was trying to talk like their favorite rapper might say it. 
this is a messy thing to say and it's messy to talk about, but that is a real thing. And it's certainly a real thing that you and I have encountered out in the world. It's not great. That doesn't mean it never happens. And Morgan Wallen was caught. I believe the the slightly broader context was he was either his house or was renting a house. It was sort of consistently disruptive, which is why the neighbor sort of sensed the disruption and said, ah, I'm getting this on tape. Like, I'm, t- I'm tired of this person, this person who's absolutely a nightmare. And that was consistent behaviorally with what you'd seen from Wallen. Apparently, there was also an arrest prior to the SNL thing, like a public intoxication kind of thing. You know, Morgan Wallen, a young star, habitually outside and, and being a little bit reckless. But when he was caught on tape, that instantly became TMZ fodder then ultimately fodder for a broader reckoning about race and racial justice in Nashville, in country music. Wallen spoke about it a little bit in an apology afterwards. He did a Strahan interview, Good Morning America, a little bit later that year, but never really kind of stepped up to the plate to talk about it. Like you say, we still don't know about the friend. We don't know much about the context. We just know that he fumbled his way through an admittedly pretty bad thing. His apology was a real apology. He said, I'm sorry for what I said. It's inexcusable that I I should never have used that word. So it's not as if he didn't apologize. But yes, he didn't offer more details. He didn't reorient his career to be a career that's all about fighting for racial justice and working against racism. He kind of said, like, I messed up. I said this thing I shouldn't have said. I should say, like, there was a real consequence which is he became the first mainstream country star since the Dixie Chicks to have his songs pulled off of country radio nationwide. Although for a brief spell, like this is the thing, like all of the things that happened that were punitive for Wallen, they felt like big shows and especially from a genre that likes to kind of like cover its own and protect its own from controversies, especially against the liberal media and so on and so forth. Quote unquote, there w- it was actually quite striking in those weeks right after to have a bunch of people say, no, we don't accept this. It always felt a tiny bit hollow, though, TBH, because you always felt like right underneath. They're like, ah, it's fine. That's ah, well, fine. You, you always you have this thing right in country, which is you have like the country establishment and the corporate part and you have the fans. And back in the day when the Dixie Chicks were pulled off of country radio for saying in the context of the build up to the Iraq war, telling an audience in the UK that they were embarrassed that George W. Bush was from Texas, you had both, right? You had the country clear channel and the big kind of corporate radio station saying like, we're not going to play the Dixie Chicks, but you also had real anger toward the Dixie Chicks from country listeners. And that continued, right? The Dixie Chicks still haven't had another country radio hit, although they're starting to be welcomed back at award shows and things. But, you know, it's been 20 20 years. years. The difference with Morgan Wallen is it was no small thing to pull him off of country radio. He was the hottest country star that there was. He had the hottest album in the market. And the radio station said, we're not going to play you for a little while. The difference was... I didn't perceive any sense among the mainstream of country radio listeners, country fans, that people wanted him off radio. No, not at all. And so, I mean, this is the thing about country music, but this is also the thing about radio. And this is the thing about popular music in general, which is that usually sooner rather than later, the fans get what they want. Two things. One, was the punishment sufficient? And two, has the punishment concluded? Obviously, he's been restored to country radio, selling out tours, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other ways in which people can be punished or held accountable. And I wonder if we look in the micro way of what happened in 2021 of that time window when he was kind of like yanked off of his roller coaster and and sort of sat on the sidelines. Was that sufficient, do you think? And then do you think there's some part of the punishment that's still ongoing, even as his career is basically just back to the same path that it was before. When I'm writing about music, I I tend to be really conscious about not giving advice to musicians about like, oh, the song should have gone like this. You should have done this after the chorus. Like, what do I know? But maybe more controversially, I try not to give advice to genres either. I I, I think of myself as someone who's really interested in music. Often a song that goes to the top of the charts, I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have necessarily expected that song would be a big hit. And so similarly, in the the situation of Morgan Wallen, 
I never thought of myself as being in the position of saying like, well, here's what his quote unquote punishment should be, or here's what should happen when a white guy drunkenly uses the N word with his friends. I'm just someone who's like interested, like who, how do people feel about him? What does he represent? And I think there was a change, which is that, as you saw with the SNL booking, he was in a position where it seemed like he was about to be maybe more of a kind of a crossover star. Yeah, like a Garth. I think he was a Garth in the making, a Shania in the making. I actually remember thinking the the SNL booking was really ahead of its time in the initial booking. I remember thinking, oh, this is great. This is actually someone forward thinking on the SNL staff. It's funny to compare them because she's so much less popular. But you think about someone like Casey Musgraves, who is celebrated within the cultural elite beyond the world of country music more than, say, well, more than, say, like Kenny Chesney, who by any metric is way more popular, right, than Casey Musgraves, but doesn't get the same kind of critical respect and doesn't get the same kind of coolness that is associated. And so the sense I got was that maybe he had the potential to kind of go over there a little bit. And maybe because of this N-word controversy and because of the way that country fans rallied to his defense, I don't think it was a defense of country fans saying, we love the N-word, but it very much was country fans saying, we're not going to let you people in the media in New York and LA tell us who to listen to. We're not going to tell you to boycott, that we have to boycott this guy that we love. And so he became a more tribal figure than he had been before, right? It, it was like loving Morgan Wallen after this was a way to like stick it to the entertainment establishment. I was at- Yeah, we were, you were at the Garden. Were you at that show? I was at, at that garden? show, yeah, but like, I also was at the shows. He did a couple warm-up shows in late the previous year or, or a couple months prior, and I went to one in Kentucky. It was really striking because my take on Morgan Wallen, album one, album two, is essentially- whiskey soaked sensitive lover man not a radical not certainly not a political radical not even someone in the toby keith vein or even the trace adkins vein not even slightly like does not like the politics at, at most if he's introducing cultural politics it's the sort of classic rural versus urban divide it's country ass shit with my country ass friends that's that's the most kind of like flag planting that he's doing i was shocked to see him treated essentially like Toby Keith at this Kentucky show. That was, and, and nothing on stage justified that treatment. And you realize that people had come to associate him with the broader value system that they were bringing into the room, especially in the wake of 2020 and saying, ah, maybe we're tired of this and we're going to support this guy. And to be fair, that's something you see in the genre, right? Like I remember seeing like Eric Church at Madison Square Garden, another of the biggest country stars, if, if people don't know, from North Carolina, I believe. And people were chanting USA between songs. Now, Eric Church- Very complicated figure. It's not yeah. like he has, but it's not like he has songs about patriotism, nope, it's not, right? It's not, not like he's like a Lee Greenwood. No, but there is this sense that this genre really means something and that loving this genre means something and that being in this room, all of us who love this kind of music and this guy, it's a tribal experience. And I think if anything, the controversy with, with Morgan Wallen saying the N-word just amped that sense up so that when people between songs are shouting, let's go, Brandon. And they feel like we're really here in a kind of tribal way. We're making a statement by being at the show and saying, like, you can't tell us what to do. And as someone who, like, I grew up going to punk shows. And so that energy is really familiar to me. That sense of, like, we're here in this room. We're sticking it the broader to world doesn't understand. Yeah, F the broader world. This is just for us and for our people. So I thought it was a really powerful concert. And it was an interesting example of how that controversy maybe slightly changed the way he's perceived. I feel like it didn't change. It did change how he's perceived, but I don't think it changed very much about what he did. Yeah. And he's probably been smart to like not come out with an album about cancel culture. Or something. I mean, I don't <laughs> like, here's the thing. I was sort of wondering, I, I never thought he was going to come out with an album or even a song about cancel culture, but I, I, I actually kind of thought he might go in the opposite direction and basically just do like a, like a post Broadway girls EP of like collaborations with rappers. Oh yeah. We should mention he had this track Broadway girls with Lil Durk. Let's listen. Wait, first of it's all, actually, let's listen to Broadway girls. Right. Let's listen to the right, Wallen section of, of Broadway girls. I met her down at Althane. She said that she saw me walking in about a mile away. Bean just had to take her phone and I just took her smile away. She said I'm too drunk and crazy. She don't like the way I dance. I said you don't have to join this. 
So this is like the Wallen soft reintroduction, this song, which is kind of like it's my song, but it's not really my song. And it's a little Dirk song. And it's a it's a great collaboration, two great tastes that taste great together. And also conveniently, it's a collaboration with a black artist who does not appear to have a problem with the fact that I use this slur whatever way I used it. Not just a black artist like this is a hip hop artist with as much cred as any hip hop artist. And so Broadway Girls, a very good song. So you like it more I than do I do like it more than you do, but I think it's a very good song. Yes, I know you, you mentioned in your face. I love the idea of it. I was like, this is the greatest. I went, when I heard it was happening, I was like, oh, I can't wait. And then I don't know. I was like, I think it's like a solid B plus. But that was an interesting thing, right? It was a way of him acknowledging a few things. One that like just about everyone who's his age in this country, he's what is he? 29 or something like anyone else. He grew up on hip hop and he really loves hip hop and that shape. You can hear it in his phrasing, certainly when he sings. And then maybe politically, like maybe it's helpful to him just to say like, Hey, actually like there are lots of black people in this country and like, they're not all mad at me. It should be said. And I don't know what your experience at the garden show was, but like when I was at the Kentucky show, Look, there were not loads of non-white people there, but there were some. Like, it wasn't like a 100% white space. There were people, there were black folks, there were folks that were not white, basically showing up and and had no problem. Yeah, I mean, certainly in, in New York, it's very rare to go to a show that's actually pretty much all white. And like... If you do, it's probably less likely to be country than to be like a Bell and Sebastian Ooh, show. Or hey, yo. <laughs> Part of the problem when we talk about music and race is we don't have great stats. And it would be really interesting if those stats were available and you could look artist by artist to see like which artist had like the widest fan base or the least white or, you know, where how does techno compare to like black metal or I don't know. It would be interesting. Spotify leak, leak the data, Spotify drop the data. <laughs> But but generally speaking, when someone is as popular as Morgan Wallen is, you're going to get all sorts of people at the show because that's what part of what it means to be popular, even country popular. Without sort of being prescriptive, as you said before, do you feel like there's some ongoing punishment that's either overt or subtext? Because I, I do I do feel like there is. And I think that that's like still there is still a shadow that he's operating under. There is this sense that like whatever crossover in, in in so much as that is a thing, whatever crossover possibility he had in the wake of the success of Dangerous has been tamped down somewhat and that there are still some corners that he is not welcome. in. you know, when they announced an Opry show for him last year or whenever that was huge, huge pushback from black country performers, black, the, the organization, black Opry, et cetera. There are rooms that he's still not welcome in no matter what kind of soft acceptance he's trying to display with like other corners of the black community. But this is why this is so hard to measure because yes, there's certainly outlets. I'm sure it has affected his reviews, right? I'm sure the new album gets more negative reviews in some outlets than it would if it hadn't been for this. There are artists and there are listeners and maybe there's even executives that feel like, no, F this guy, like this guy's on the wrong side of some sort of divide. At the same time, maybe it galvanized some of his fan base and like caused more people to rally around him. How does that all balance out in terms of his overall popularity? I don't know. I mean, what I know is that in general, when someone, if he's able to keep making hits year after year, a lot of people will kind of come around. Like that's the thing about the music industry is like beyond a certain point, If you're really popular and you're throwing this big party with a lot of people, like people will kind of want to join. If we're thinking about infractions of this style, like I always think of the John Mayer Playboy interview that didn't derail John Mayer's career. Not not to a crazy degree. Maybe it reoriented him a little bit. He's still a very popular performer. He's maybe not like a pop hit maker, but this is maybe the direction he was always going to be heading in. But I just remember thinking the the level of infraction felt really, really high. And yet John Mayer is still a force for for better or worse. You don't want to weigh infractions against each other. I just, I feel like we've been down this road before and seen people recover. So it's not as surprising to see Morgan Wallen, a person who is potentially at the peak of his fame, separate from this, still be able to recover and move forward. Yeah. And I mean, it's something that obviously is part of the conversation in all sorts of popular music. You know, you think about hip hop, where often there are stories of of bad behavior or lyrical content that people object to, like, right, this is... If anything, like this is the history of hip hop is the history of people 
pissing off, whether it's they're pissing off the FBI or, or parents or, or ops or parents or whoever. Or, yeah. Or academics or whoever. Right. And, and, and there's different rules in different genres. I often think about how like it, the whole thing about like getting your chain took and like that in hip hop, that could really mess you up. Right. Because like all of a sudden your, your life doesn't match the perception and what you're putting out there on the record in a different genre getting your chain took wouldn't matter at all. So the question of what the rules are, it depends on like what community you're trying to be part of. Certainly if Morgan Wallen were a different kind of singer with a different kind of fan base in a different genre, maybe he would have had to do more penance for being caught saying the N-word on tape. I feel like there is still an implicit penance by the, the sort of wall or invisible fence that exists between him and frankly, most of the outlets that are in conversation with the outlets that we, that we write for, who I think are generally kind of like, nah, we're going to let this one go. You know, there's probably people who can't hear me right now because they've turned off this podcast because they're not trying to listen to a podcast about Morgan Wallen in twenty. To be fair, they just turn off normally when I'm here. So that's <laughs> that's got not a whole lot to do with the subject. But yeah, I feel you. No, but this is the thing. And even doing, frankly, even doing an episode and having this kind of conversation it feels lightly fraught because I just think that there are a number of people who don't want to have the conversation whatsoever. I think it's not worth having, but I, it's hard for me to understand how we don't have a conversation about a person. Number one, who's one of the most popular musicians in the country. This is, this is literally our jobs, but also who is coming out of a controversy at this level and remains sort of astonishingly popular and not attempting to reckon with that doesn't feel like the right solution to me. Part of what I love about popular music is the way it generates fights and the way it generates these communities and the way these communities are different. That's part of why I'm kind of obsessed with genre in the first place. I think sometimes when you hear people talk about Morgan Wallen, it's easy to imagine that the appeal of him is strictly that he's polarizing rather than the actual appeal, which is like he makes amazing songs. And when I talk to him, I wasn't sure if he was exactly sure how he did it. Like <laughs> yeah. he has this incredible knack for, for, and sometimes it's songs he co-writes. Sometimes he's just an interpreter. And he's a guy who didn't grow up listening to country music. He grew up listening to like Nickelback and stuff. And now working and with Jody Moy, who's Nickelback's producer, real full circle moment. When you look at him and when you talk to him and you try to figure out like, what is it about you? And like you have this voice and you're phrasing and you have an ear for a hook. It's really incredible. And it's still to me as a fan of his and someone who's spent a lot of time thinking about him. It's still a little mysterious how he has as many great songs as he does. All right. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go to a break. We're going to listen to Born with a Beer in My Hand, which is the first song on the new album. And as close as we get to like some kind of mea culpa, but also very notable that it's the first song. And then he just dispenses with it and kind of gets back to business. Born with a beer in my hand, we'll be back after this. When I put them down, they put me through hell. Put some scars on some trucks myself as well. But if I never did put that can to my mouth, I wouldn't have nothing I could sing about. Okay, we're back. K San is here. We're talking Wallen. We were just kind of getting into the nature of the songs. First of all, I don't think this album is as successful as the last album, like on pure musical terms. To me, the approach that he nailed and the producer nailed on Dangerous felt really coherent. The songwriting was really strong. The songwriting feels a little bit more hit or miss on this album to me. When I'm trying to understand Morgan Wallen's success, I'm thinking of Wallen as a sort of post Florida Georgia line figure, obviously an early collaborator with Florida Georgia line. So I'm thinking of him in a post Florida Georgia line, which is to say a country artist who is mindful of hip hop, but is not trying to show off that he's mindful of hip hop and, and where Florida Georgia line went, you know, I don't know if you can say they went wrong per se, but where things started to go a little bit weird is when they were over indexing and then when they kind of got caught over indexing, basically just completely retreated to ultimately very benign and banal non hip hop type records. Wallen seems to have taken, especially on, on dangerous, a couple of key elements, some phrasings, some drum patterns. He's not doing Sam hunt. 
but he's ju- it's just enough to kind of nod and be like, I listen to those records too. That to me is where the success comes from. It, it's importing a couple of key small pieces of that value system and putting it with his accent, the mullet, et cetera. That voice and the, the grain in the voice, the fact that when he's singing, sometimes it sounds like he's not fully opening his mouth. So there's a certain like, there's like a rhythmic precision mixed with a certain amount of under enunciation that I think is really good. It, it makes him, it makes his singing sound really talky. And obviously that talkiness is something kind of borrowed from hip hop, but that talkiness helps foster a sense of intimacy. Like he's just like, he's not on a stage performing. He's just like some guy at the bar, almost under his breath, telling you stuff about his life. That's also what the live shows were like. To be honest, the moments during the live shows where he's really opening up, I found to be the most jarring. To me, the most the most successful moments during the live shows were when he was basically doing the quietest songs. And those were the most out of step with what the audience, I think, was expecting. But to me, musically, that was the most successful stuff. There's this tradition in country music that sometimes makes me think of hip hop. There's this hip hop tradition of like omerta, right? I'm like like a guy from the streets and I don't rat, I don't tell, but I'll tell you some stuff. And in country music, there's a similar thing of like, I'm a stoic. I'm not a crybaby. I handle my business, but let me tell you how I'm feeling. And like that push and pull is something he really nails. And it's part of the reason why, you know, he's had extraordinary success at radio and on the charts. You Proof went, was number one for 10 weeks on Country Airplay. I think that was a new record just this past winter. So, but even beyond that, there's people who have success on country radio where it doesn't quite translate into that cult of personality in the same way. Whereas with him, people are, they love his songs, but there's something about him that people really love. He has this kind of like understated charisma. And yeah, I think, I think all these technical things are important. Even on the new album, he, he flows a little bit, right? Sometimes when he hits a line that has a bunch of syllables, there's a song, Whiskey Friends, where he sings, we just need a slow song, trying to let her go song, throw a little Jones on, leave us alone till she's long gone, right? He's spitting from a distance. He can seem like a really simple kind of thing that he's doing, like a simple figure, but it's really is a a hybrid kind of music that he's making. To me, there are two songs on the new album that really also lean into that, whether it's flow pattern or nods to maybe the more musically progressive parts of his audience. Those are obviously Lifestyle, which interpolates Lifestyle by Rich Gang, and also Ain't That Some, which comes early in the record, which really feels like if he was going to make like what we would think of as a country rap record, this is like with respect to kids, this is kind of what it would sound like. Let's actually listen to Ain't That Some. Ain't that some back home, but in a field, mud on the wheels, yeah, ain't that some thick smoke, silver ride old, tearing up a two lane road, ain't that some steel, you and T-R-Y, we've been doing since we was yay high, there's folks out there, ain't T-R-Y, this, man, ain't that some, that you hate to grow up and miss, hate to think of what is. I didn't expect this album to be as similar to the previous album. The ways in which it's different feel really small. If it was going to be different, I'm, I thought this is the direction it would be different in. You think this is something he's good at? And if so, why do you think he didn't sort of lean into it a little bit more? That's a good question. I mean, I was thinking about his, his friend and collaborator, Hardy, right? Who makes this album that is like a concept album, right? And the new Hardy album, it's like, it's half country, it's half rock. The song in the middle goes from country to rock to let you know that you're moved, right? It's like a a conceptual thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Morgan Wallen does like a tight little 45 minute more conceptual album, which is his bid to win over whatever, Grammy voters and music critics. This is like the opposite. I mean, I don't think we've mentioned it yet. This album has 36 songs on it, even though it's not necessarily a hip hop album in terms of like his delivery. It reminds me a little bit of the hip hop album release strategy, which is like, here's a whole bunch of songs. Each one has a chance to be a big hit. So like, let's see. Joe uh, Coscarelli, my colleague, like when the album came out and, you know, you look at the iTunes chart or the Apple Music or whatever the hell that's called these days. And of the first 40 songs, 30, all 36 of the Morgan Wallen songs are in the top 40 or the top 50. And Joe just tweeted Morgan Wallen is a rapper. You know, which is, again, that strategy. I mean, I don't know if that strategy is going to last forever, but in this particular peak streaming moment, that is the way. Do you feel like Wallen doesn't quite know what is going to be accepted from him? Like, could it be the more hip hop oriented records? Like, might it be the ballads is throwing this much into the pot? 
obviously part of it is like a, a statement of purpose to be like, I was away for a while. I did a lot of, well, I don't know if you didn't did a lot of writing, but I did a lot of recording and I want to let you know that I'm back. But is part of it kind of like, I'm not quite sure what, what y'all are wanting from me right now. To me, it sometimes is a little bit unpredictable what ends up working. From the last Dangerous, the double album that came out in 2021, one of the biggest, if not the biggest song from that album turned out to be Wasted on You, which is, yeah, a great song. But, you know, at the time that the album came out, these other songs seemed so much bigger, More Than My Hometown, Seven Summers, and obviously his uh, his cover of Cover Me Up. Yeah, Jason Isbell's record. That's like one of his defining records now. And it was a defining record before all the bad shit happened. Like, it's, it feels like a record that would have been a defining record in the wake of all the bad shit. But in fact, it just was the defining record, which kind of lets you know how people perceived Morgan Wallen even before all these infractions. Like, people perceived him as someone who was, like, always on the edge of doing a, doing a bad thing, but kind of, like, is sorry. Like, we'll let you know that, like, he wants to be forgiven about it. And so the new album, to me, it sounds a little bit like him saying, like, instead of trying to make a concept album about, like, the controversy or about how I'm thinking about myself related to country music, I'm just going to go to work. Like, I know what I do well. I know the kind of country meets rock song that I do. We'll have a couple of trap snares or 808s here or there. I'm going to be working with my a lot of my normal collaborators, right? We got three co-writes with Hardy. We got, I think Ernest has like 11 co-writes on this album, who's another singer and songwriter that's close with, with Morgan Wallen. So Ernest, to me, is like the old-fashioned country side of Morgan Wallen. His most recent album, Flower Shops, which he just expanded with 12 extra songs called Two Dozen Roses, you know, he's leaning against a 75 Cadillac on the cover, and it's a very, like, kind of more 80s, a little bit 90s country sound. And so you hear some of that traditionalism in the Morgan Wallen album, and then you hear some of the more very current-sounding songs that he has, songs that sound, some of them as if they were written to a track rather than being written to chords with guitars. To me, Last Drive Down Main has that kind of feel where it's fast and it almost sounds like Morgan's just flowing over a beat rather than like starting with some chords and building a song around that. So it's almost like an anti-concept album. It's like, yeah, it's not 36 songs. Like, no, it's not an arc. It's not necessarily a journey. It's just like a lot of songs of Morgan doing what he does best. And to be honest, like, I still haven't fully wrapped my mind around exactly how I feel about it. I've listened to it a bunch of times, but it'll take me a long time to learn a 36 song album. It sounds like there's enough stuff on there to keep country radio busy for the next two years. But also, as we know from his career, it seems like he's always putting stuff out. So I wouldn't be shocked if we heard even more songs by this fall. I think a song on this album that really does achieve in so much as there's a balance to be struck and maybe it's not that orchestrated, but I wrote the book feels like a song that really somehow like meets the moment, feels like a classic Morgan Wallen song, also has a lot of radio potential, et cetera. Let's listen to I wrote the book. I met a good girl. She had a life straight. She said she loved it. I was good at everything. One day she left me in a class. I think if you're looking for lyrical threads on this album, which obviously this is an album written by several other people in addition to Morgan Wallen, but if you're looking for lyrical threads or choices about what he's deciding to record, there's obviously a strain in this record about penitence, about sobriety and struggles with alcohol. Again, not unfamiliar from prior Morgan Wallen. This is not, he did not wake up and decide to do records like this that were new to him. And one of the songs is Don't Think Jesus, which was released kind of in the wake, I think back in 2021, even in the, in the wake of the controversy. That sounded like a stain song to me. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> well, know, yeah, Aaron Lewis. The country star Aaron Lewis. One of the most effective protest songs of uh, the last few years, I think. If people are curious, it's Am I the Only One? Am I the only one not brainwashed? Making my way through the land of the lost Who sees it as it is And worries about his kids As they try to undo all the things he did Am I the only one Could Wallen have released essentially anything? Like the tour selling out felt preordained It makes me feel like 
the substance of the music, the musical qualities don't matter all that much. And I wonder if the Wallen that we're going to see on the road is also going to have that same dissonance as the Wallen that we saw on the prior tour, which is to say the person on stage is not really lining up musically or dispositionally with the audience that is showing up. You mean the audience wants something a little rowdier they or want is something. envisioning him as some kind of like cudgel in the culture wars. But remember that even before he was any of this other stuff, he was maybe primarily a heartthrob. And that's a big part of what he still is. And that's a big part of why people are going to see him. That's a big part of the crowd reaction he gets is people screaming for him because he represents a certain archetype of hunkiness. So even when he's singing like a breakup song, like Hope That's True, which is this kind of wry breakup song on the album, I think that is always going to be a focal point. More, I think, probably more than the politics and him him playing that role. And I think the underside to that heartthrob role is the idea that he's like a slightly damaged heartthrob or that he's a heartthrob maybe with some problems, right? That he's, he's trying his best and sometimes he's going to screw up and that somehow makes him more appealing because he's a flawed heartthrob. And I think that is the real overriding often the persona you hear on the record, right? And that, that's where the, that's, it's a smart way of integrating that whiskey soaked thing into his broader story. He's like, yeah, I'm drinking. It's okay, but sometimes it's not okay. And that thing of like, yeah, I'm going to kind of like make some jokes. I'm going to kind of be this like sexy dude. Like that's an important part of who he is. And I, I suspect that that really takes center stage when he's on tour. To pick up on the thing that you were saying about him being like a lightly broken heartthrob, I will say that listening to this album top to bottom, obviously it's very long. Your, your mind goes in and out as you're listening to this many songs back to back. But I will say that a line that jolted me back into the album at like the midpoint is very much in keeping with what you're describing, which is at the beginning of Neon Star, which opens with, yeah, I'm down bad. Yeah, I'm down bad. She slammed that door and she broke my heart. That girl so got out of town fast. She bounced, so I bounced in here trying to bounce back. Ooh, I know I probably ought to throw a couple prayers up to the man. Again, the sort of tacit acknowledgement of this larger, this meta narrative that he has admittedly saddled himself with. These are like his burdens, like nobody's burdening him. These are these are burdens of his own decisions. But having moments like that or um money on me, which comes a little bit after that which is a, a song about if you're looking, essentially, if you're looking for a good guy or an uncomplicated guy, like, don't put your money on me, which is great, great little turns of phrase in that. To me, moments like that don't only function as heartthrob records. They don't only, only function as broken heartthrob records. They also function as nods or winks to a discourse that he absolutely does not want to participate in, but wants to at least acknowledge that there is some psychic toll that he's still carrying. Well, and this is also the interesting thing in Nashville, which is that obviously there's a long history of country songs about messing up, about drinking, obviously about cheating. But at the same time, the country music industry is still like wildly old fashioned. If, if you're listening to this and you've never listened to like terrestrial country radio, when they play the songs and then between songs and they do a little commentary, the commentary will sound like it comes from the 1950s, right? They'll be like, guess which country star just adopted? A new puppy. And then they'll that like go to the that next was really song. Good. Like that. that was good. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like there is this sense that like fans want to hear some of that, but some of that stuff that in the world of like mainstream pop music or certainly hip hop or some other places, things that would be wouldn't be considered shocking still would be kind of considered shocking. So there's this there's this desire in country music for all the male stars to be like good married family men even as they're singing these songs about other things, whereas there isn't that same expectation necessarily for, for singers in some other genres. And so I think that's part of the line that he's walking. As crucial as radio is to the Morgan Wallen success story, during that dry period, after he was pulled off radio, streaming is what really bolstered him. And obviously you've seen a sea change in what's happening in Nashville in terms of how it's reacting to streaming posing a threat, an existential threat to the dominance of country radio. Obviously, the rise of TikTok, creating a, a class of stars who are really, really popular with young people, but maybe have not 
fully made radio rug. You're smiling. I love to see you smile. I know we're on the same page. Don't you think on some level that the Wallen story is a testament to the power of an audience that is not fully a country radio audience. It's an audience that is choosing to hold tight to him. And it, they happen to hear him on country radio. But these numbers, I mean, you look at the Spotify stream numbers on Dangerous and on this new album, you're talking hundreds of millions of streams. These are not accidental numbers. These are numbers that keep him in the top 10 week in, week out. Yeah, and in that sense, maybe it's a bigger version of what you saw with Eric Church, a country singer who built his career largely on the road and country radio kind of came along a little bit reluctantly and ended up playing him. But his audience was always bigger than what you would see, think based on his country radio numbers. Argue one of the most influential country singers of, of this century so far is Miranda Lambert. And she did a similar thing like country radio sometimes played her, sometimes didn't, but she was a vivid enough personality and had like great enough records that she was building a fan base that wasn't entirely dependent on country radio. So you could see what he's doing maybe as like a supersized version of that. And that's partly maybe why the band didn't last longer. The band wasn't broken because like someone in Nashville issued a statement and said like, we're going to play Morgan Wallen on country radio again. The band ended because local stations felt like they couldn't hold out anymore. Their listeners, this was like their listeners, number one artist, and they were refusing to play him. And, and as I said, beyond a certain point, the listeners are going to get what they want from radio. That's kind of the whole idea of radio. So yes, I, I, I think absolutely there is a sense that he's leading and radio is following. Whether at the moment that, local stations started to play him again or now when it's sort of just a given that country radio stations are playing Morgan Wallen. Is there any political valence to that? Do you think? I mean, there's yeah, a political all valence right. to everything. All right. <laughs> all right. I mean, I don't know. There's how, how could, yeah. How could you make any programming decision, especially in a genre like country, but wherever that doesn't have some sort of political valence. And, and part of what that is, is again, this sense of like, we don't care about your rules. I think one thing that's really changed in entertainment in the last quarter century is it used to be easier for different genres to be different worlds with their own rules. And I think because of the way social media puts us in conversation with each other, a lot of those conversations have kind of become one conversation and the kinds of things they're arguing about in Essence Magazine or on ESPN or in Teen Vogue or on the radio, like they're all kind of sometimes it feels like everyone's having the same argument. And it seems like part of part of what's happening with the Morgan Wallen argument is this idea of of the country world saying like, no, we're going to have slightly different standards here than you might have over there. And like over there, you might not think he's really ready to be redeemed, but we disagree and we're going to have like self-determination within this genre and we're going to say, no, he's good. We're fine. You argue about Morgan Wallen if you live in the world where having arguments about stuff like this is sort of like the coin of the realm. But if you choose not to live in that world, you can not only ignore the specifics of the argument and try to fall on a side, one or the other side, but you can just ignore it altogether. And I think that's, in essence, what Nashville decided to do. And I, I think I can see, obviously, why some people were alienated by that, obviously. But it feels like that wall was built. And then for folks who still want to argue about it, maybe those people will just never arrive at this particular party. And maybe that's fine. But isn't it partly about raw numbers? Like, if you actually polled Americans and said, like, a drunken white guy was caught on tape saying the N-word. What should the consequences be? I don't think you'd get a huge number of Americans saying like, oh, he should be like his career should be suspended for two years. Like, I just don't think that that's a very popular point of view. I think it's maybe overrepresented possibly in the media. I think that that sometimes it can be a little confusing, but I suspect that especially within but not only within country music, I think a lot of people would be like, hey, he said a bad word. He said, sorry. Like life goes on. I'm not sure that that's a very unpopular point of view in America at large, let alone within the country music world. But just because it's popular doesn't mean it's right necessarily. And I think that's kind of like the, the pressure point that whether it's folks in the media or radio or even in Nashville institutions, that's the needle that they're trying to thread to say that was wrong, but we're still going to play him. That was wrong, but we're still going to listen to the record. Or maybe I choose not to weigh in on whether that was wrong. But, but I mean, we're also like butting up against one of the reasons why you and I are actually 
like so interested in this, which is that we have still in 2023, we have R&B, which is perceived as black music for black people. And I don't think that either of us think that that's bad. I think we celebrate the fact that R&B exists and is great. But numerically speaking, if you have certain genres that are disproportionately black, you will also have certain genres that are disproportionately white. That's just math. And part of what's interesting about country music in this moment is trying to figure out like what that means. Like, what do we do with the fact that this genre has been perceived for decades as being defined by the fact that it is disproportionately white, both in terms of artists and in terms of listeners. And despite its roots in black song, tabling that. Well, of course, yes, every yes, all it's, this is American music, right? It all traces back to black music, but it also all has like roots in white music too. Yes, there's no pure racial descent in any of this, but in terms of the way it functions and sometimes behind this, there is this idea And you hear this in Nashville now that Nashville needs to change, that Nashville should be more integrated, that country music should be more integrated. And it's a complicated demand because part of what that is, is a demand that country music should become more like the rest of the music industry, that country music should become, in this sense, more like other genres. And so this really complicated question of like, How weird, how anomalous does country music want to be, racially, politically, or otherwise? How different does it want to be? And how should it think of itself if it remains, as it is today, a disproportionately white genre? And I think that's a question that underlies a lot of these debates and discussions. I always felt, and maybe this is me and my own particular set of cultural interests at play here, but I was always waiting for that to become the dominant idea in Nashville or to be more pervasive. And I, every time a performer would come along who really, really dabbled in the space effectively, or perhaps to my ear, not effectively, but in a kind of blunt force way, I was like, here it is. Okay. Everything that follows is going to kind of go down this path. And there always seems to be some invisible barrier that those folks can't get over. And again, getting back to the Wallen thing, Wallen seems to have thrived by at best, nodding or winking at that stuff and weaving it in. But it's never going to be overt. But this is the interesting paradox. At the same time, in country music, you have musicians who use very traditional instruments. They're all about the mandolin and the pedal steel and all this stuff. And maybe often those musicians culturally, maybe they live in New York or the Bay Area. And so their connection to country music is primarily through these specific musical traditions. And often what you have with Morgan Wallen and some of the other people incorporating hip hop is the opposite. Musically, they're borrowing from all sorts of stuff, but they have a cultural specificity that describes Morgan Wallen's life. He grows up listening to Nickelback. As he told me, like when he started singing, he's like, I don't know, it just came out country, right? The idea is like, no matter what kind of music he listened to, because he's culturally country. And so a lot of what you've seen over the years is that musicians, whether it's Blake Shelton rapping in Boys Around Here or it's Florida Georgia Line, is a lot of what you hear is that often those kinds of musical hybrids work the best when they're paired with cultural specificity. I'm so country culturally that I can borrow from hip hop and still be country. And so in, in an odd way, sometimes those hybrids actually work, work to shore up that cultural identity, even as they're complicating the musical identity. Right. Blake Shelton does Boys Around Here, and that's it. He doesn't do 10 songs like that. He doesn't remake that as his entire identity. He does it and says, no one around here knows how to do the Dougie because he wants you to know that he can, like you say, he can dabble in that, but it doesn't change the core of who he is, either culturally or musically, mentally. One of the interesting things about hip hop, obviously, is that it's remained both musically fairly specific and culturally very specific. And as that changes, maybe it becomes more available for country stars to make that a bigger part of their identity, by which I mean, like, rock as rock and roll got less culturally specific, we went from the 1970s when the Eagles couldn't get played on country radio to nowadays. It's not like anyone complains when there's a big guitar solo in the middle of a country song and you have artists like Keith Urban who are basically rock singers and guitarists, in Keith Urban's case, and no one questions their cultural credibility. 
But there is a sense now where like sometimes you hear in a country song, they'll shout out rock and roll as a way of like shoring up their country credibility, right? You see people on Broadway in Nashville wearing Guns N' Roses t-shirts or Jackson Dean singing about ACDC, or there is this sense that like part of what it means to be country now is to listen to rock and roll, but that's only possible because the mainstream has moved on and the stuff you hear on pop radio doesn't sound like ACDC. And so maybe we get to a point where the stuff you hear on pop radio doesn't sound at all like Jay-Z. And then like the sound of 90s Jay-Z is available to be like incorporated by country or by some other artist without diluting that cultural specificity. Is Wallen peaking? Or do you feel like we're living with this level of Wallen for 10 more years, 20 more years. It's kind of the Madden curse where like whatever football players on the front of the Madden video game, that there was this idea that that was a curse because the next season wouldn't be as good. And it's kind of like, well, no, maybe that's just like statistical regression to the mean. Whoever is the best football player right now probably will have a less good season. And typically anyone who's as popular as Morgan Wallen is right now, typically that's probably going to be their peak. But that said, like this kind of popularity has a really long half-life. It's almost like no matter what happens, Morgan Wallen will be at least two-thirds as popular in five or ten years as he is now. You look at Garth Brooks, and Garth Brooks achieved this like white-hot popularity in the 1990s so that like decades on, even though his new songs are no longer necessarily going up the radio charts— he still draws a huge crowd. And as long as he's willing to work, people will still come out there and he still defines an era. And I think Morgan Wallen definitely defines the current era. I will say when we were talking about punishment before and the implicit ongoing punishment of Morgan Wallen, I do wonder if there's a time period and I don't think we're in it right now, but we may arrive at it a year, three years, five years down the line where that invisible punishment has gone away or softened to the point where maybe there are more overt crossover, maybe he's more welcomed in media-oriented spaces, that still could happen. And I wonder if that is actually still a layer of success that's available to him that might make him somehow even more popular than he currently is, although I wonder if being accepted in those spaces will ultimately undermine the reason why he's been so successful within the walls. As you were saying that, I was wondering if you were thinking about Eminem and Eminem going from like the most controversial figure in popular music, popular culture, and people are boycotting. Just a few years later, you get 8 Mile, which is precisely that higher level of popularity for Eminem, where all of a sudden people who don't like hip hop are super into it. And Maureen Dowd and Frank Rich are writing about him. And it's like a whole other thing that's happening. Yes, that's rare. And once you have that, as you see with Eminem now, like it doesn't really matter what radio does. Like Eminem has been in the stratosphere ever since. And so, yes, that's that's possible. I think that's for anyone, including Morgan Wallen. I don't think think that would be expected for Morgan Wallen, but it's out there. The flip side of that is when you don't achieve that kind of really mainstream crossover, that just gives you more country credibility. What's a Wallen song? that's underappreciated or underheard that you want to go out with? A slept on Wallen song. I would say I love Quittin' Time. It's a song co-written by Eric Church. It's the last song on Dangerous, the double album. Just a a beautiful song about drinking and maybe not drinking anymore, but probably maybe drinking some more after all. As time bore out, probably drinking some more. Okay, a joy, a pleasure. I finally did it. You did finally do it. That is our show. Listen to every podcast ever at nytimes.com slash podcast. Email us at podcast at nytimes.com. Get the t-shirt. It's the podcast. Okay. You got t-shirts? You want a shirt? Yes, I want a shirt. All right, I'm going to mail you a shirt. It's the podcast.myshopify.com. Get in the Facebook group. Get in the Discord. tinyurl.com slash podcast Facebook slash podcast Discord. Subscribe to podcast anywhere you get your audio content, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, yada, 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 yada. Our producer, as always, is Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. It's quitting time. It's all day thinking time, and all night drinking time, and time to sing, and time to find it. Ram has a reason. Time to pack it in and stay down. Pack it up. Yeah.